There's nothing worse than showing up to a new venue, standing in the middle of it, clapping, and hearing it going on for about 16 seconds. <laughs> that is boominess at its worst. It's this echoey, low-end mush that just really is hard to make sense of a mix out of. You're, the folks on stage who are playing have a hard time hearing each other. Your audience is squinting with their ears to make sense out of what someone's saying. And you're having a hard time because you just really can't help. You want to throw up your hands and say, this room is terrible. I never want to mix here again. Well, we can't change the room itself most of the time, but there are some real strategies to help make sure you can control boominess and pull out clarity when you need it. There are ways to solve things on the stage with your sound system. And as long as we understand the underlying physics at play and know what solutions are the right solutions to the wrong problem, to the wrong problem. Today, I wanna to help make sure you understand the actual problem, what's going on, why tiny little EQ cuts at room modes are not the solution, how you can eliminate what's unnecessary to create clarity, and how you can make sure the human brain is actually setting itself to succeed to hear in the right way with the way you set up the sound system. If you're into making your PA sound awesome, AKA not boomy, but clear, I think you're gonna love my audio math survival spreadsheet. It's available at the link below, or you can get it at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit. It's got over 250 rows of calculations from anything from helping you to place your front fills in the right place, know if the speakers you have in the track are gonna adequately cover the audience shape you have. It's gonna help make sure that you plan your line arrays the right way. Anyway, it's, it's available to you for free at the link below. I hope you snag it. So let's jump into our video and how make sure our PA and our mix is not boomy, even in the worst of rooms. Before we jump into the strategies of how to mitigate boominess on our shows, I wanna talk a little bit about what's going on under the surface. There's a lot of confusion and misunderstanding here of how low end actually behaves and where boominess come from and what the heck are standing waves. So I wanna help clear that out so we have an understanding of the root cause. Then we could jump into how we could reduce boominess on stage with our sound system deployment and how we mix. So here I found an incredibly helpful website by Dr. Dan Russell. He's put together a ton of these graphics here of how sound works in these waves. And what we have here is a standing wave. What a standing wave is, is very similar to a room mode. It is a room mode, is when a given frequency is within a space or a tube or a room that has equal dimensions as that wavelength or or intervals thereof. So a 100 hertz wave is 11.33 feet long. So if I were in a room with that length, it would do weird stuff. And it's because it's bouncing and going through its positive and negative pressure cycle at the same rate as the room and creating standing waves. So here I have an illustration of the actual air particles at the very top up here. So this shows the positive and negative moving back and forth. And this is what the air is actually doing. We're here used to looking at voltage or pressure. So we've seen this happen in audio waves. If like we record it, we hear the positive and negative amplitude. Both are pressure, just positive and negative, and they're moving up and down. But here in the middle is something called a node when they combine together and create maximum positive and negative summation is an anti-node. So that node means we have no chance of hearing that frequency at that point in the room for walking along it. And along those nodes, we have a huge buildup of that frequency. And that's reflected here in a waterfall graph. So on our waterfall graph, our y-axis is the amplitude of the frequency. So it's this is pretty high here at 70 Hertz. Our x-axis is the frequency graph. So here we have 30 Hertz all the way up to 200 Hertz. And our z-axis it coming towards us is the time in milliseconds. This is from zero to 400 milliseconds. So what's happening here, right here at 70 Hertz, it has a high peak and it's taking longer to decay than the rest of the frequencies. That's what creates boominess. Something happens and we hear it ooh, resounding and reverberating around. We also see a big mode here at 34.32 Hertz. So in this room, I could sit in my chair and then move backward and at a given point in the room, depending on its length, 
I'll be able to hear a huge buildup of those two frequencies and I move some more, then I'll hear them completely die out. So here, say this from the beginning, there's some advice out there that says, hey, put out a measurement microphone, find your room modes, use some EQ, tighten it up and, and get rid of them. Well, this isn't gonna work because we're not mixing for one single spot in a room. This might work in a studio setting if you're very careful with it, but you cannot make this true for the entire audience. It's a regular pattern throughout the audience and it's going to change depending on the harmonics above. So we have here, this is a one representation of a room mode, but depending on the frequency, here is the second harmonic. And then we have the third, fourth and fifth and so on and we have different patterns of how they're combining and canceling out throughout the room. And that's just in one dimension. So just the length of the room. It's gonna be different for the width and for the height. And then for those are axial modes. And so it's <laughs> it gets pretty complicated very quickly. And the point I'm trying to make here is don't try to be an acoustician on site with your sound system. You cannot do a whole lot to mitigate this with EQ alone. We're gonna talk later about general EQ shapes and LF management you could take advantage of, but don't try to get smart or cute here. You can only really get rid of low end by absorption or diffusion. So huge diffusers or generous amounts of absorption placed in specific places. That's why some, some curtains aren't gonna cut it. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Bottom line, low frequencies are really hard to eliminate because of their wavelength, because they're long, they can bend around things and have a hard time being absorbed or converted to heat. High frequencies, no problem. Their wavelengths are really short. You could do that with. You can hear my studio. My voice has a nice tight sound because I have plenty of absor absorption around and I'm not speaking at 30 hertz. <laughs> the bottom of my voice is somewhere 120, 150 and these panels around me can handle it. But the thing is they are six inch deep panels and they're are meant and designed to do such a thing. Most venues that we're working in don't have that. They, we don't have a bunch of nice treated panels sitting around. We're in a gym, we're in a museum, we're in a brewery, we're in a hotel ballroom. So we have to do other things to help manage low end by cha besides changing the space. Just to show you how futile <laughs> saying like, hey, the carpet is going to pick a problem is, I've got here another great article by Dan Russell and there was a room of his on campus. We could see here, this was the room and then they installed some carpet before it was just concrete. So he took a recording of him clapping with the room empty and has an incredibly long decay time. It's 3.2 seconds, which is crazy. And then he clapped again later on after they installed the carpet and it shortened it significantly. So I'll let you hear that. Here's the hand clap without any carpet. Now here's the hand clap with carpet in. Now here's Dr. Russell talking in the room without carpet. I am standing in a very reverberant room. Now here I'm talking with the carpet. I am now standing in the same room after carpet has been applied to the floor. Pretty cool, right? We did hear a significant change. He was able to reduce the RT60 or the amount of decay happening to, for the sound to decay on average 60 decibels from the start to its end from 3.2 milliseconds to I think 2.3, which is, you know, over a, which is pretty awesome. So here are the graphs he provided us. This is at 500 hertz, 1000 hertz, and 2000 hertz. The red line is the original and the black shows it dying down at a steeper rate, so decaying faster at 500, even faster at 1K, and then it's fastest at 2K. So we are moving up in frequency. It is easier to absorb with something like carpet. This does zero help for us at low frequencies. So uh, all that to say, you need to use the right tool for the job if you're gonna reduce decay time with absorption, and that is thick, panels of, of absorptive material like Owens, Owens Corning 703 to make that happen. And since we are often in venues where we can't do that, I would say we need to use other tools and strategies to make that happen. So let's jump into those. I've got four main ways that we're going to mitigate boominess now that we understand a little bit more of the phys physics behind what's going on. Number one is reducing the amount of sound sources on stage. When we are working with our musicians, it's tempting to throw up a wedge everywhere and be ready for anything, 
but see if you can push them to in-ears or even run their amps direct through something like a quad cortex or helix or something like that um, instead of having to have it live. Because if you got two guitar players, a bass player, in a five-piece band, that's two electric guitar amps and a bass amp, and then all of them have wedges, that's five wedges, that's eight more sound sources than your PA, and all of them are going to be radiating low-end boominess all over, making it hard for them to communicate and hard to listen. So making things clear and direct and not swimming in reverb is really helpful. So see if you can push them to run in-ears and make their guitars and bass go direct. I know that's not quite as fun. You can't feel it in your chest. It's, I mean, being able to stand in front of a Ampeg SVT fridge and feel that pounding you is awesome. But if the band's on your side and they want a good show, uh, I think they'd be willing to work with you to make sure you get the results that you're after. Number two is prioritizing high frequency coverage almost over anything else. What I mean by that is we need to put speakers in the right spot and have them close to people that they can hear. In other videos, you probably hear me talking about getting your speakers high up in the air so you can get them away from the first row and decrease the distance it takes from the speaker to the first row versus the back row. This is decreasing the front to back distance ratio so that your folks in the front are getting blasted and your folks in the back are, are not able to hear. What I would recommend in a super boomy, boomy room is actually having a pair of mains if you're running a left-right setup and see if you can add some delays and then run the whole thing at a lower volume. I've got a video that tells you how to set up delays and know when you need them or if that's possible, but if you have enough speakers to do it and enough outputs and processing, that, that can make, make sure that your back row isn't forever away from the actual sound source because the farther we get in distance, the more swimmy um, and something that critical distance takes over and that critical distance is the, the ratio of the direct to reverberant sound is equal. And once you get farther from that, you hear more of the actual reverb of the room than the actual direct source. If you're closer, then that ratio increases. So being able to add delay speakers when necessary and doing it right can help provide more clarity to your show. If you don't have that luxury, I would make sure the speaker placement is and make sure you're aiming as absolutely fine-tuned to prioritize coverage over anything. Make sure that everyone you know your speaker coverage angles. If there's a 90 degree speaker that is pointed towards the middle of that zone, it is covering because our brain latches on to high frequencies for clarity. It's the reason when someone goes Psst, and to get your attention, you're, you immediately shift and find it. So our brain can localize, find, and make sense of high frequencies much more than low frequencies. With this, don't try and get cute and move a speaker to a certain spot so you make a room mode not as excited. Because like we see here on these graphs, we have a mode and it's successive harmonics. The red dot is the speaker moving throughout a space. So we can move it and it will change the response, but it's gonna change it unequally throughout. We do not see the same rate of change at all frequencies throughout where the modes are. So you might be fixing a problem at one frequency and making it worse at another. So prioritize coverage over managing any specific room mode that you are encountering. And my last point on number two on prioritizing coverage is make the eye and the ear work together. If we're on the front row, of a stage in a huge arena, and for some reason there's not front fills, and it sounds like sound is coming from 30 feet above us, that's weird to hear someone singing right in front of us, but sound is coming from up there. So back to our using mains and delays, don't be afraid to sneak some front fills down at the stage so we can draw the listener's attention to the front of the stage. This is kind of breaking my rules of on stage of eliminating all the monitors and eliminating the guitar amps and bass amps. But if you're able to tie them together as a cohesive system and manage the total amount of low end they're putting out, the net positive gain of having high end that will draw a listener's attention to the right space helps make sense in the in the brain and the eye matching and hearing the sound where it's supposed to be coming from. Now let's talk about steering low end. How can we actually control the wavefront of where the low frequencies are going? Here I am in map 3D and I've got two subs right in the center of a stage and let's look at 100 hertz. This gives us a nice oval shape and it's moving throughout and I think is a good shape for this audience. Let's say if we did like most folks do and just throw them left and right, we're gonna get some power alleys and valleys. So I'd say room modes are already hard enough to deal with and make sure that it's even. Do not put your low 
frequency sources apart and create even more problems for yourself. I have another video called Left Right Subarrays, uh, everything you need to know, and I'll walk you through the pros and cons and if you're forced to do a left right setup. So it's not hopeless, you just gotta know what's going on. But I'll say that the room modes offer enough anomalies. So keeping low frequency sources together, make sure they can couple. So that's one way of steering the low end is making sure you're not getting uh, these power alleys and valleys. Now, if we wanted to do more active steering of the low end and not just mitigate the power alleys and valleys, we can use a cardioid subarray. So here I've got a four element inline cardioid subarray, and this is at 63 Hertz. So I'm going to hit predict. If we see here that we are rejecting sound in the back and making it go forward. This is much similar to a cardioid microphone pattern. So by not having all this low end bouncing off the back wall and coming back, we make a tighter sound. And we have less low frequencies swimming around. So if at all possible, if you have the processing and or know how and can put your subs together, I highly suggest making a cardioid subarray happen. I have two workshops on those and I'll put links below or some cards here and you can check out how to do that. Moving on to number four, we can shape our low end effectively with EQ. So here are the right EQ moves you need to be making to make sure your low end can translate. This is some traces I took from a recent show I did. It was actually outdoor on a city square, so not a lot of reflections other than the concrete floor and then the building behind it. So this is the PA on axis in the front row pre-EQ. And this is the target curve I wanna use. And we can see here the biggest discrepancy here is, the, is in the low end. And so I wanna make sure I can bring down the slow end. And how did I do that? With a low shelf. So I was on an M32, got a different show file pulled up here, but I went to the EQ and put this down to low shelf. I have that way up here at 590 hertz. I bring that down 6 dB. So don't be afraid to move that low shelf way up and make sure that that low frequency rise and contour isn't rising too fast and we're getting too much pink shift. So pink shift is the ratio of low frequencies to high frequencies as we move backwards in the audience. We're going to get more low end to top end and then vice versa as we move up. So I wanna make sure that's even throughout my audience or at least moves gradually in a way that I want to happen. So this is how I usually solve that low end problem. So I think I ended up doing a six or seven dB reduction and this is where I was able to get to post EQ. So I brought down some of this top end and then I mitigated this low end rise and made it rise at a rate I was comfortable with and sounded good, so low end EQ. And I also did similar EQ moves, not across just my mains, but my fill systems. Across my front fills, I had some side fills because those big mains are generating a lot of low end and those zones are overlapping. Even though I have my mains pointed forward, I had my outfills pointed off to the side, they're, they're high end or high frequency coverages are different, but low end is just gonna orb out. Even I only It was a six box line array, so not very long. So it's not gonna be able to steer low, low frequencies very well. So don't be afraid to use that low end shelf. I usually do it from about 1K and below and able to bring down low end so you're to minimize the amount of low end sources that are bouncing around. So that's a common theme. You don't want low end from your wedges, from a guitar amps, from a bass amp, and your PA swimming around any more than it absolutely has to. So we've talked about EQing the system. How about the EQ on your actual channels? So if I would go to a about this band vocal channel, I would start with my high pass filter a little bit higher, maybe 160. Don't be afraid to bump it up to 200 then also use a another filter to, pr to figure out how you can make the proximity effect of someone getting close to a vocal not be as pronounced. So I can wind that out here and I just, I'm just not scared to get rid of low end where I needed it. I started at the right places first, the stage, my PA, and now my mix, but just roll up those high pass filters if you can. And then don't be afraid also to use a high shelf to dig out that top end if you need it. That 1K is that, that filter tilt point in my mind where I'm able to bring up top end where I need it and then reduce low end where I don't. Last point here with mixing is don't run your subs on an aux. I've got my left right main mix here and I'm sending it to each of these matrix locations on this show. I had a PA in and out, I had a couple of K12s inners and then outers, uh, but they're on the same plane, so I didn't have to run them as delays. 
I had some front fills and then subs. And so subs are not on an aux. If they're on an aux, any global EQ decisions I make on my left, right across the entire rig are not going to be reflected there. I have to chase my tail and say like, do I need to bring down the subs on a particular aux center? Do I need to use EQ? So you're just going to use EQ and make sure the entire subsystem is balanced. So I recommend you do that for controlling low end. If you need to duck your subs some, you can just always reach over here to your subs matrix and bring that down. Um, and then if an individual source has too much low end and you feel like it is coming from your subs, then you can bring that down uh, with EQ, not with the send. All right, that's how to deal with boominess when you're mixing a live show. We talked about the physics of how boominess actually comes about, how low frequencies behave, and then some actual strategies for making that happen, starting with the stage, moving to how you deploy your system, and then how you mix. I would love to know below, are there any strategies that I've missed? What do you do on shows to help make sure boominess does not make anyone have a terrible experience while you are mixing? My name is Michael Curtis. Thank you so much for watching and make sure and download my audio math survival spreadsheet and I will catch you next time.